Hello, I'm Dr. Ali Katus, and I'm very happy to be here to share this information with you. So without further delay, welcome, and I'm going to get started. So first, I'm going to need to share my screen with you. Let's go see here. And start the slideshow. There we go. Um, let me just start here. Um, I'm with the Weingarts Institute of Catholic Research, where I'm a research associate. And this is about historical evidence for women's ecclesial leadership, information we don't always see. And I have a focus on, in the, especially in this presentation, on uh, evidence uh, that's iconographical or, or from art from the early Christian era. So all of the iconographic artifacts that depict women at a Christian altar that we're gonna see in this presentation are older, get this, are older than the oldest surviving art to depict only a man or only men at a church altar. So what I'm going to show you is that we see women at church altars before we see men and just men at church altars. We see women and men and we see women only. We don't see men only. Pretty interesting, huh? All right. So for more detail for this presentation, please see my articles. Um, these are both directly related to it. The women, and I, I have other articles as well and, and writings on these matters. For example, in my art, uh, Mary and Early Christian Women, Hidden, ev um, hidden um, Evidence. Uh, but here, these two are really easy to read. The first one and the second one goes into even more detail. So women leaders at the table in early Christian churches in the Priscilla Papers spring 2020, and also something that re very recently came out, um, women church leaders in and around fifth century Rome in patterns of women's le leadership in early Christianity, which is edited by Joan Taylor in Ilaria Romali and published by Oxford uh, University Press this very year. So it is actually not the cheapest book, it's around 100, I think, um, should come out in paperback, but perhaps you can get it at your library um, or just order these pages, 228 to 60, which are the article that relates um, to uh, women in and around, women church leaders in and around 5th century Rome, including much of the material that we're going to see here and in greater detail than I can provide you right now. So the first of these is on an first of these scenes that depicts women at an altar is on an ivory reliquary box, which is usually dated the late 300s to the early 400s. It was discovered in 1906 beneath the uh, what would have been the altar of an early Christian era church um, in just outside of Pola in Croatia, and it was dug up um, in the early uh, 20th century, in other words, and. When it was first discovered, um, the archaeologist who was associated with this site, Anton Gnier, said it was a very important artifact because it depicted the early Christian liturgy. Um, in fact, uh, it may be the very oldest scene to do so. And there's really no debate here. Um, and this actually is the subject and on the cover of my um, article in the Patterns of Women's Leadership, as you see here. Uh, depicting a man on the left and a woman on the right at an altar table. So this is the full scene. This is in the center here is what you see on the book, and that's the area of the altar table. And, but interestingly, on both sides as a uh, kind of a gender parallel liturgy, you've got two arms raised men on the left, two arms raised women on the right in the Holy of Holies or the sanctuary of this church. And you can see it's an early Christian church. We have the Early Christian cross, the Cairo, the Alpha Omega, the sheep. It's, um, there's no question or debate. Here's another cross down here that this indeed is an early Christian scene. So what isn't controversial about this? Um, absolutely, there is no controversy that there are three men on the left and three women on the right. Still today, no controversy whatsoever about this. The center scene, also no controversy, man on the left, woman on the right. And for the first 40 years after it was discovered and a little bit longer, there was no controversy that this man and the woman were at the altar table of an early Christian church. 
all the art historians who studied this, and there were a lot because this is a very important scene because it's the liturgy and so early, um, agreed this is a man and a woman at an early Christian altar table. And here we have it more close. It's basically a gender parallel liturgy scene, liturgical scene. Again, here in the center is a man on the left and the woman on the right at the early Christian altar. And some scholars have suggested that the woman is lifting some kind of cup or bowl or chalice. So interestingly, um, this was, although not initially by Anton Mears, very soon identified as quite likely being the sanctuary of old St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It has these six beautifully curved, carved spiral columns, which are almost identical to the six columns that were known to have been part of the ciborium, that is the part over the altar, the ciborium here, uh, in old St. Peter's Basilica, reputedly donated by Constantine. And these curved spiral uh, pillars are still in the galleries of the modern St. Peter's Basilica. A replica is slightly like them, but much taller and more delicate are around the um, altar area in the new St. Peter's Basilica, the modern one built around 1500s um, when the old one was completely destroyed and, and replaced. And these again are still present in the galleries of the modern St. Peter's. So they some scholars began to say, hey, hey, this looks like it must have been a scene in old St. Peter's Basilica. Now, none of them could figure out why a man and a woman would be at the altar table. They just couldn't quite figure that out. But nonetheless, there was agreement. There was a man and a woman. There were men on the left, women on the right, and that was an altar table in a basilica, probably old St. Peter's. So these six spiral columns, they look just like those famous spiral columns, still preserved. And this is how they would have looked, how the ciborium would have looked in most likely in the apse uh, in the original uh, old St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And you can see there's a big lamp that hung over the uh, altar area and really lit up the beautiful mosaic in the uh, apse behind. It sat right on the cord of the apse. So we have a gender parallel liturgical scene in old St. Peter's Basilica. What will the Vatican do about that? What did they do? So in 1940, um, at the beginning of World War II, the box was taken to Rome from Croatia in order for, for safekeeping. And in 1941, the Vatican began excavations beneath the high altar of the modern St. Peter's Basilica. And directly beneath the high altar of the modern St. Peter's Basilica, they found a stack of medieval altars, just a stack of them. And they couldn't get into this from the, from the um, front of the high altar because you know, that's where the tourists are and that's where the liturgy takes place and everything like that. So they came in from behind, be, um, they went in down below, I think it's called uh, Clements or something like that, um, uh, sanctuary or something like that down below behind the high altar, uh, out of the way. And they came in behind that stack of um, medieval altars. And at the very bottom, they found uh, what the, an eight by eight shrine with a stone tabletop and legs, just like this. And it even had a carved niche in the back of the shrine. And beneath it even was very nearby was a, um, a tomb structure. And the art, Vatican archeologists believe that they had discovered and generally it's well accepted that they had discovered the second century shrine to Peter with its stone mensa or tabletop. And in fact, the entire basilica had been oriented when it was built 
um, around this shrine. So over the years, um, changed the entire area was deconstructed during the time of Greg, Greg the Great. The, the columns were removed and uh, another altar was built on top. And the only thing that survived uh, at all, except for just a couple minor things on the, on the side, were, was this uh, big stone uh, wall with the um, tabletop, two legs in the front of it, and this um, curved area behind. In this picture, you can see that it's been embellished, or at least the artist depicts it embellished with um, um, marble. But the original was not marble. So what did the Vatican do? I mean, really, can the Vatican have a man and a woman at an altar in old St. Peter's Basilica? Again, at this point in time, there was no discussion, no debate. This was an altar. This was an altar table in a church, man and a woman at it, and on either side, men and women in the Holy of Holies. Pretty controversial, eh? <laughs> so it took nine years for the um, Vatican archaeologists to come out with their report. And they showed pictures of a square ciborium. Now we've just seen back here what looks like more like a half Hexagon, ciborium, not square. But the Vatican archaeologists included a couple of drawings and a painting that made it look like it had been square. Now keep in mind, they were unable to excavate at all in front of the high uh, altar or in front of the shrine. That was not something they could do. And in fact, almost certainly everything there is gone. Uh, given the renovations that have taken place, starting with Gregory the Great, right on through to uh, the modern St. Peter's Basilica, but they did not even excavate there. So they are hypothesizing. And that whilst they agreed that this must, this ivory scene must represent old St. Peter's Basilica, a scene in old St. Peter's Basilica, they all agreed on that, the Vatican archaeologists did. They presented a square ciborium. Now, what difference would that make? Well, as Engelbert, uh, one of the, uh, Kirschbaum, one of the archeologists said, well, we have to suppose uh, about a 10 foot by 10 foot uh, ciborium, uh, which crossed in the middle and from which the big lamp hung and then it would have hung, the light would have been right there in the middle you know, so actually this is getting to be um, quite a ways away from the altar where the lamp is. And according to Engelbert Kirschbaum, there would have been, that's where the altar would have been and it must have been a portable altar. So you can see the implications of this, right? Suddenly there's a portable altar, invisible in the scene, not the altar that was the altar, oh no, not the altar over St. Peter's tomb that Jerome and actually Gregory of Tours both said was over Peter's tomb. Uh, but no, a portable altar that we don't know about, but we must hypothesize inside of this square ciborium because that's where the light would hang, right? Well, of course not, because we've just seen from the, the ivory itself that this is not, it was not a square ciborium. It was a half hexagon uh, type ciborium, a trapezoid. So it's taken a little while to and that there was a lot of motivation, gender politics, especially with the uh, discussions about the ordination of women priests in the Anglican church that um, motivated the discussion forward that th this was, um, that there was a square ciborium and, uh, and a portable altar in Old St. Peter's Basilica. Certainly no women or men at the, you know, no women at the altar in the sanctuary, surely not. This, and so this became the idea, well, this was just a, a saint uh, where people would go and you know, kind of give homage to St. Peter. And see, some people might say, well, maybe they were venerating the cross, but as a Vatican uh, historians themselves said, there was no record of any uh, uh, true uh, remnant of the true cross in Old St. Peter's. And so that was rejected, even by the famous Joseph Wilfred himself, who was a Vatican um, archaeologist and photographer of the catacombs and other art in Rome. So it's taken a while to untangle them because that's kind of what has then suddenly become, well, from a woman, a man and a woman at an altar to a woman and a man at a saint's tomb and the altar being a, 
portable altar. That's what the Vatican did. But fortunately, very fortunately, um, you know, we've been able to untangle that. And finally, we are getting some very good recognition uh, in that we're even published by Oxford University Press, sort of the gold standard for scholarly work. And uh, a great detail in where I, I tell the backstory um, along with uh, um, Luca Bedini Campolonieri, who's the director of Weingart's Institute for Catholic Research, um, tell the story of, of what happened here and then what the Vatican did and then how it's easily seen and untangled once we kind of remove the veil from our eyes and quit believing everything we're told by the Vatican. So, but were there possibly other examples? This one was, was uh, discovered in 1906. In fact, another similar type of uh, artifact uh, was discovered in 1988, also in the 20th century. And this one is as old um, almost, or maybe not quite as old as the uh, ivory box that depicts Old St. Peter's Basilica, the scene in Old St. Peter's Basilica. And this is probably a chancel screen with a liturgical scene, but it was reused as a massive front of a sarcophagus, a smaller sarcophagus in an underground um, tomb area called a hypogeum right by the Theodosian walls in, in Istanbul. And it was dug up and the, the whole structure was dug up in 1988. And the uh, first to report on it, Umit Saradaglu, who is the archeologist on site and also Johan Deckers argued that, well, these were very likely um, uh, very similar to those that were known to have been in the second Hagia Sophia. The second Hagia Sophia replaced the first Hagia Sophia and it, the second Hagia Sophia burned to the ground in the Nika riots under Justinian and was itself replaced by the current Hagia Sophia with the big bulbous um, dome that we're so familiar with today in Istanbul. But this is the second one and it was consecrated actually by the Princess Pulcheria herself, who was in about the year 430, um, who was the, um, uh, the guardian of her younger brother her parents, their parents had both died and she was the titular basically empress of the time. And interestingly, and closely associated with this, at this around the year 430, 431, um, Constantinople got a new patriarch, Nestorius. And the a document called the Letter of Cosmos says that Pulcheria had been accustomed to standing in the Holy of Holies with her younger brother during the communion. But when the new patriarch came in, he said he stopped her and her ladies at the uh, at the door of the Holy of Holies on Easter morning and said, only priests can come in here. Well, you know, Princess Pulcheria was understandably a bit upset about that. And believe it or not, there was a massive in, in 431, I think there was a massive council that, known as the Council of Ephesus, where Nestoria was uh, himself, Nestorius, was booted. He lost his, uh, he no longer was a patriarch and he was exiled. And I assume, we can assume, that after that small impediment, uh, Princess Bulgaria, the titular empress, resumed her previous custom. And in any case, Although we don't know this represented Pulcheria and her younger brother Theodosius, here he stands with an open book as if he were a bishop with his hand in, as if proclaiming or speeching uh, in its speech gesture. Um, here is a man who has a sim almost identical impose down to the pointing of their toes um, to, to the woman on the right. There's an early Christian cross with curtains and a ciborium, a very beautiful and uh, would appear to be an altar as well. And uh, so this is a really interesting uh, scene that appears to be a gender parallel liturgy, not in Rome this time, but in Constantinople, the um, capital of the Roman Empire, the new capital of the Roman Empire. This scene is actually validated by another scene a little over a hundred years later, which is found in San Vitale's um, Basilica in Ravenna, 
Um, and it was built around 550 by Justinian. And it has two really remarkable, beautiful mosaics on either side of the altar cable. And on the left, we see uh, Justinian and his men. And on the right, we see Theodora and her women. And this is often thought to have been a liturgical procession in the Hagia Sophia, although not everyone agrees what kind of liturgical procession. Um, and perhaps some people don't think it was a liturgical procession at all, but in general, uh, it's generally thought to be some kind of liturgical procession in the Hagia Sophia that still stands today, which Justinian built. And you see that Justinian on the left holds the plate for the bread, and Theodora on the right holds the chalice for the wine. So here we have some more gender parallelism. And again, these just as in the last two artifacts in Old St. Peter's Basilica and in the second Hagia Sophia, the same purported, which it seems to be thought to represent the liturgy in the current Hagia Sophia, has the men on the left and the women on the right. Now, in the scene of Justinian, we have uh, the Bishop Maximianus. We know him by his name is over his head. Um, at least, and he seems to have a polyum running over his shoulder, an Episcopal polyum. Also, uh, a man with uh, what looks to be a book of the Gospels, so another cleric. And then also, um, the very first image that I know of, at least the very first one I believe is the case, of a man with a censer in a church setting. And so probably perhaps a deacon. So Justinian has on, on the right here, he's got three clerics. Well, arguably, so does Theodora. And um, she's holding the chalice. And then on the right here, we see um, two women who have these long uh, polyam type uh, Eucharistic handkerchiefs, whatever they might be called, as um, Alexei Lido calls them. And also a third woman who is holding one of them. And he says, why should we doubt what they are just because women are holding them, and Alexa Lido being one of the foremost uh, Byzantine art historians. And in fact, this is very similar to a scene um, around 500 years later in Rome, Old St. Clement's Basilica, which is the lower basilica, um, the first one where we have um, a, a painting on the wall of, paint, of uh, Bishop Clement purportedly about to perform the Eucharist, and you can see he's got one of these in his hand, just like she has one in her hand. He's got an open book in front of him. He's got the chalice and the plate for the bread, and of course, the Episcopal polyam. Interestingly, also, these, we see three sets of red shoes, and he's got a red shoe. Well, that's interesting, or maybe four. Anyway, maybe it's not interesting, but uh, the red shoes are typically sort of associated with the Pope, as some of you may know. So here we have what appears to be a liturgical procession in the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Here is one last very interesting um, pic from this era. It's um, dated to the 500s in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, it probably represents the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, um, which is uh, kind of um, mimicked in its round shape. And here we see um, the altar. It's a stone tripod altar, apparently, with a gospel book on it, a big lamp hanging over it. It has uh, spiral columns also, like an old St. Peter's to an extent. And it also, like an old St. Peter's, appears to be a half hexagon. And I've often, or sorry, yes, yeah, a half hexagon. And I've wondered sometimes whether St. Peter's, the Savoyan Old St. Peter's was built as kind of a, a mimic of what we see here um, under the dome, perhaps um, in, in Jerusalem. Also the curtains on the side. So we also see two women with censers. And this is, to my knowledge, the very oldest depiction of anyone with censers in the scene of a church and it's women. And it's some decades earlier than the one of the, the oldest image of a man with censors, which we just saw. Now, this is a really interesting piece because these women are approaching the altar table 
And they're part of a procession of women around the outside of the pics. Also interesting is that these women also appear to wear some kind of liturgical or clerical insignia, uh, perhaps the Eucharistic handkerchief, perhaps some kind of polyam, but it's hanging from their, their belts. Or maybe it's not hanging from their belts, but it's coming out from underneath what almost looks like a chasuble. Here's the back. Go again. And it really is quite interesting that this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, of course, is where Jesus first appeared, is, is you know, the empty tomb, which is uh, right where Jesus first appeared to Mary Magdalene and the, and the women, according to the Gospels. And so perhaps it absolutely makes sense that there would be a memory of this um, or a practice associated with this uh, in that very church. Uh, which is so closely, the event itself, so closely associated with women and the, and the authority of Mary Magdalene, for example, almost as, or as bishop of the bishops, if the apostles, the men are assumed to be bishops, where Jesus sent her to tell the men the good news. So we have here a liturgical procession, I would say, of women clerics to the altar. And this is considerably older, then the very first image of a man in a real church. But I'll get to that in just a moment. First, one last thing I'm gonna show you, which is not in a church, but it's in the catacombs. And this is in the Marcellino Marcellino and Pietro catacomb in Rome, Christian catacomb. And there's a really remarkable thing about the Christian catacombs in Rome. And these, these funeral scenes, um, invariably depict a woman raising the cup in these Christian scenes. Whereas in Roman funeral scenes, it's invariably a man who raises a cup. So this is something different and very unusual and very uh, worth knowing about these Christian catacomb scenes. So this one's dated uh, somewhere in the late 200s to early 300s. And you can see there's a little table with what looks to be a fish and bread on it right there in the center, a little mensa, tripod again. And we see the woman raising a glass or a cup. And interestingly, over here, we see a man also with a cup. And it's been noted that many of these depict a pair, a male and female pair. Um, and to me, this uh, scene of the man and the woman both with a cup um, is reminiscent of something that Irenaeus of Lyon described in near in churches that he had known, but not his type of churches, these other churches he didn't like, these other Christians who fought, you know, or Christ followers, perhaps is better to say to say at that time. And he wrote about how uh, they in those churches, the woman sac sanctified the wine, consecrated the wine. He used the word Eucharistine, and then they mixed it in the man's cup. And then of course, you know, they, they served. Very interesting that this early scene, um, very much, very close in, in tone in nature to that described by Irenaeus. Of course, if this woman were a man, perhaps we would have said very early on, they'd all be identified as early scenes in churches if it were a man, but everybody agrees this is a woman. The one who's raising the cup, that is. So here we have a woman raising a cup in the early Christian catacombs of Rome, dated around a hundred years or so after Irenaeus said something about a woman um, consecrating the wine in her cup. And uh, we also have a scene around a hundred years after that in old St. Peter's Basilica above ground of a woman appearing to lift some kind of vessel, perhaps a cup at the altar table in this case. And here in, uh, we have uh, the Empress, herself holding a chalice um, in what in Ravenna, uh, which seems to be part of a scene around the year 550 in the Agia Sophia in Constantinople. So what do we have? Women raising cups very early, not just at altars, but raising the chalice. So what happened? What happened? Well, a lot of things probably happened, but one thing probably happened was this kind of new art that came about 
oh, 25, 15 to 25 years after the art of Theodora raising the chalice next to Justinian raising the patin, all these gender parallel liturgical scenes. And this was a strange scene. Uh, there's two of them, one in the Archaeological Museum in Istanbul and one in Dumbarton Oaks Museum, which this one is, which depict almost like a double head of Jesus, two Jesuses. Suddenly it's not a man and a woman anymore. It's like this fantastical figure, this imaginary scene, put on the plate for the bread, sort of like the most important place for propaganda, perhaps, where we've got two Jesuses. The only place I've ever seen anything like this is in association with the communion, supposedly the delivering of the communion about this time. We see it in a gospel book about this time, the Rosanna Gospels, and also we see it on these two, um, these two big plates. And they're silver stamped um, to this day, 565 to 578, clearly after Justinian and Theodora. And what do we have? We have 12 men, nothing but 12 men, two Jesuses and 12 men, which is very different from what we saw in Old St. Peter's Basilica, where we have a man and a woman at the altar with what appear to be the Eucharistic utensils who were flanked by two women and two men. Gender parallelism, gender parity. This is the very oldest scene that I know of, of a man at an altar table in a church <laughs> and performing the Eucharist. And it's a man and only a man for the first time around the ninth or 10th century, it's an archbishop performing the mass. Much earlier, of course, hundreds of years earlier, we have the scene of women and an altar and women in a liturgical procession to the altar. And that, my dears, is the end of my story. I would be glad to answer any questions you may have by email. And I'm sorry, I cannot be there in person. Best wishes.